Okay. Okay, so namaste everybody. Um, my name is Hemans. I live in York, in North Yorkshire in the United Kingdom. And um, I worked for many years in IT, information technology, worked in many countries, um, including the Far East and the US before I settled down here about uh, almost 16 years ago in the UK. So, but uh, right from the very beginning, I've had a tremendous interest in, in the cultures of different countries and of course the culture of India and also in cultural psychology as to you know, what makes us who we are. And um, one of the most interesting subjects that I always find is the subject of religion in any country, be it Hinduism or Christianity or whatever it is. So um, this particular session today um, is about Hinduism and it's about basically the intention is to provoke thought and try to understand what it is um, and also to have a look, a critical look at the word itself, Hinduism, and to see whether it is accurate and even appropriate. So um, with that, um, I'm, I'm just going to proceed into uh, the presentation. Yeah. So as I said, um, we're just going to be looking at certain aspects in this in this section. So perhaps next week, you know, um, whatever is left over, we, we might have to delve into, into, into that part. So first of all, uh, I would like to look at, um, you know, the etymology of the word Hinduism. Etymology is basically the origin of a word. Where does a word originate? Where does it come from? So you have to go into the root of that. That is basically etymology. And then we will also look at the nomenclature of the word. Nomenclature is basically the set of rules uh, that you use in order to give a name to something. Okay. So for example, um, if there is a city with three towers, and if the city is just called three towers, that's a perfect nomenclature for, for that particular city. So um, we will have a look at uh, the nomenclature of um, Hinduism. Of course, there is no escape from history because basically history is nothing but a record of human behaviors. History isn't just about dates. Um, you know, history is about um, actual human psychology in play at different points in time. And that's the reason why we say history repeats itself because human beings rarely change their behavior. So the other thing is the approach that I'm going to take towards these presentations is going to be a circular, seemingly random approach, which is very Indian in nature. So typically we will find that nowadays, uh, because we are all influenced by the West. Um, and a while ago, um, you know, when I was asked about this map uh, behind my back, and I told, I said that it is the distribution of the globe in terms of cultural psychology. So I mentioned one particular psychology there, which is called the linear psychology, which is basically all the English speaking countries and many of the other countries in Europe also. So these people, you know, they have a very fixed mindset, which is very structured, which is organized, which is methodical, sequential, and it goes from one point to another. In, in, in a certain logical sequence, yeah? But our Indian way is not like that. It is cyclic. And I'm going to take the cyclic approach. And there are certain great advantages really to taking the cyclic approach. And I, we shall see that in a while. So um, what I'm going to do now is first, I put a question mark here. It's a placeholder. So I want, I deliberately want to leave a question mark here right until the end, okay? Uh, till the end of the, the next presentation, perhaps the next week. So what does this represent? So what I'm trying to do over here is I'm trying to look at the different philosophies, the different margas, the ways, the different yogas, all this confluence and this conglomeration of religion that we have in India. Of course, it will not be entirely comprehensive, but it will cover a lot of things. But the basic thing is to get a good idea about you know, what it is. 
and there is a reason behind it. Okay. We will come to that. So now looking at India, um, if I look at, um, I'm not using the word Hinduism. That is intentional. That's why I have left that blank over there. So we have two margas at the highest level. One is the marga of Vishnu, which is known as the Pravritti marga, and the other is the marga of Shiva, which is called the Nivritti marga. So the path of Vishnu is the one which is within the confines of society. So you stay inside of society, you adhere to dharma, and then you strive for moksha. The path of Shiva, which is the Nivritti marga, is that which lies outside of society. So it is for all those people essentially, but not necessarily again, but essentially for those people who do not or are not a fit into society, there may be a misfit into society. That's why Shiva is the leader of the Ganas. And then we also have people who by choice, they just want to become an ascetic. You know, They do not want to stay within society and uh, follow either the four ashramas, which is Brahmacharya, Grahastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas, and uh, what is called the Purushartha, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. So both the Purushartha as well as the ashramas are confined to the structure within society, Vaishnava Dharma. Yeah. So that is, so here we can see that at the very high level, we have a choice. Again, either you take this or you take that, it's up to you. So, and you can see symbolism, you know, the symbolism in, um, in this is amazing. See, this is why Vishnu wears gold and his wife is Lakshmi because without artha or without economics, society is nothing. And Shiva lives outside of society. He does, has no need for any gold or he doesn't have a house. He lives in Kailash. Yeah. So, but again, you know, we find a unification where uh, Shiva becomes the Grahastha. So, at the high level, we have these two margas. Now, beyond this, we can look at the different yogas. And yoga, again, etymologically, root of the word, it comes from union. Yoga means to bind, to unite. So essentially, it might be the union of, you know, if you look at it from a Dvaita perspective, it would be Jiva Paramatma union. Whatever it is, it would be Samadhi, it would be Moksha, whatever we call that. So the obtainment or the attainment of God you know, those different margas, again, are the different yogas that you have. <laughs> Many of you are, of course, aware of this, but I'm intentionally, you know, laying an emphasis on this because we are going to follow a certain logical path to certain conclusions. That's the reason why I'm doing this. So Hatha Yoga, obviously, hurt her moon and sun yoga, which is the physical way. And then Raja Yoga, which is the yoga of the mind, where, you know, through meditation, you obtain moksha. And then you have karma yoga, the path of karma. Karma nevadikar asthe maafale So um, then you have jnana yoga. You have bhakti yoga. Yeah. And then again in bhakti yoga, coming down, you could, you could have dasa bhakti, where you treat God as a master and you are the servant. So an example perhaps would be tulsidas. And then you have Sakha Bhakti, where you treat God as a friend. It could be Surdas. It could be Viraha Bhakti, like Mirabai, where you treat God as a cosmic lover or a transcendental lover. So we have, again, different paths over here. You can also choose your deity. Then we have the different philosophies. Okay. So um, I'm not certain if, if the screen is covering this or what, but still I'm just going to go ahead and anyway I'll repeat it. So we have Vedanta, yeah? then we have Nyaya, we have Mimamsa, we have Vaisheshika, and then, uh, you know, we have, we, have, we have different, different, we have at least six different orthodox philosophies. We also have Sankhya. And the interesting thing here is, again, okay, if you look at Vedanta and Sankhya, there's a difference. There's a very, very fundamental difference. Sankhya does not believe in the will of a creator. Sankhya believes in uh, Prakriti and Purusha just causing a disturbance with each other and creation or 
you know, the, the entire notion of uh, material perception coming into existence. But Vedanta is again different. Vedanta believes in a creator where there is a cosmic will that really generates this entire universe. So, see, we are finding differences here. Now, within Vedanta, over a period of time, we also encountered three different uh, categories. So we found um, the original, of course, is Advaita. Advaita is monoism, where there is actually no difference between the cosmic soul and the individual soul. But it is because of Maya or you know whatever it is that you know the mind is covered by that illusion, which separates it or causes a distinction between these two. But later on, you know, we came out with Advaita. Uh, sorry, Dvaita. Dvaita was, you know, was um, propounded by Madhavacharya. And in fact, many principles of Dvaita are very contrary to everything else in the Vedanta. For instance, um, in, in every Indian philosophy except in Vedanta, Dvaita, we find that everything is cyclic in nature. There is nothing eternal and permanent. Nothing. The only thing that is eternal is the cyclicism. So, but in Dvaita, Madhavacharya talks about an eternal hell, which is very similar to Christianity. So, and then we have Vishishta Dvaita, which was started by Ramanujacharya, and there are again lots of differences between that. Again, you know, in the, the approach of Mimamsa is different from that of Vedanta. Mimamsa believes more in the ritualism rather than the philosophy. Vedanta is, of course, the Upanishads. It's the karma. It's the the Kand of the Vedas. So, which which takes a philosophical and um, metaphysical route towards, um, you know, the understanding of the universe and God. So, essentially, we are finding. You will notice that the reason why I'm putting all this is that we have lots of different paths, and also lots of different ideas. There is no unified. Um, concept or notion here. Okay. But everything is existing under one particular umbrella without any conflict with each other. There is no fight or there is no conflict. Okay. Interestingly, in the Vedas, in the Rig Veda, um, in the 10th mandala of the Rig Veda, you will find a sukta, which is called the Nasadiya sukta. It, it, it goes somewhat like this. It is na sadasinno sadasit tadanim nasidrajo no yoma paroyata kimavari vaha kohakasya sarmanamba kimasthi dhanam gaviram. So essentially, it is talking about it's called the hymn of creation. It is talking about what was there before existence, what was not there before existence, or before this entire universe came into being. But interestingly, it also questions whether the creator, whether he knew or whether he knew not. So it even goes up to a point of agnosticism. So, uh, so you know that, that's the that's the brilliance of you know whatever whatever we have here. So we have the depth of religion on one hand. We even have a, a representation of agnostic agnosticism in in the Vedas, and they're all sitting in one place beautifully, like a bouquet of flowers. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this picture. Okay, so what all that we have done is we have painted a picture with a placeholder about different uh, margas, philosophies, whatever, all these things that we have in India. <laughs> and now, uh, as I said earlier, that I'm going to take a very circular, random kind of path, which will initially not make any sense, but later on everything will connect. So now, keeping that on one side, I'm coming to a different subject which is basically logic and communication. So we are going to try and study a human psychology element over here, which is essentially global in nature. Okay. So when it comes to logic, there are essentially three kinds of logic. One is simple binary logic, where there are two answers, two outcomes, A or B, yes or no, black or white, that's it. Yeah. If A is true, then B is false. And this is also known as the Aristotelian or Boolean logic. The second kind of logic that we have is fuzzy logic. So in fuzzy logic, we have two extremes where there is a, on one extreme, there's an absolute truth. The other extreme, there's an absolute lie. 
and in between there are different degrees of truth okay so as an example um, if you look at binary logic is today monday or tuesday or is today a saturday yes or no simple yes is the answer you cannot say no to that that is binary logic in fuzzy logic um the only example good example that you can look at is a legal system where um somebody has killed somebody else and um now you have to administer a punishment to that person now if you apply binary logic then it will be you have to kill the person who killed that person that's it however in fuzzy logic you will look at the different degrees of truth you look at whether it was an intentional murder whether it was an accident whether it was a negligent negligent homicide whether it was um self defense so if it was self defense you might even acquit that person so that gives an idea of what you know different degrees of truth are yeah. and then we have a third kind of logic which is known as which is a rare kind of logic which is known as a multi valued logic in multi valued logic you have more than two values but all the values are true so in terms of human psychology um you know you might look at it that a person has three children and he loves all the three children equally really so you can call that as multi valued logic so or if you think of one of our ancient kings of india maybe he had three wives and he loved all of them equally that may not be possible but that would be an example of multi valued logic so how does this really come into the picture we'll have a look at it okay now a little while ago i just mentioned this linear thought process of the english speaking countries yeah, and certain countries in europe essentially so these are known as the anglo saxon cultures we will not go into why it is called that but we are going to have a look at what is their logical thought process so in these countries you will find that there is a binary logic predominance in their thought process yeah you will always find that there are always you know there's a dichotomy there are two poles so either you have to go for one or you have to go for the other there is no in between now so these countries are entirely about polarization yeah so for example um you look at most of these countries there are two parties which are predominant america is the greatest example republican Dem democrat that's it period in the uk they evolved a little more and then they introduced some more parties but again predominantly it's the conservatives or the liberals uh, or or labor so um many of these countries you know have this kind of a predominance now social issues for example are you pro abortion are you anti abortion you have to take a stance there is no in between are you for the death penalty are you against the death penalty mm, you have to take a stance <laughs> are you a liberal are you a conservative so what they going to do is they going to take one pole and they fight with each other they debate with each other yeah to and they fight and debate to win to prove a point so all these cultures which are the anglo saxon cultures are entirely dominated by this psychology yeah and then there is a tertiary support which is learned by fuzzy logic which comes whenever there is an intellectual question or a question of uh, legality and things like that if you know that kind of question comes then there is a tertiary support that comes in there so you will find that these cultures are extremely conflict oriented they draw lines they draw boundaries it's you and me for example look at the word alien okay they love to use the word alien as it comes from outer space now they are again drawn a boundary around the earth this is mine earth and anything outside it is an alien you know so they are very conflict oriented because their history has been full of strife war conflict killing power games you know grabbing of each other's lands violence you know their entire history has been that the end, and if you look at history you know how was the united states conquered entirely through violence by the decimation of the native indians and then the local population so you will find that this tremendous binary logic domination um, in the in their minds so it polarizes debate to win win or lose and it is very exclusive in the sense it excludes everything else now this entire world for example this map of course is not a political map it's a cultural map but this entire world map all the boundaries of the countries everywhere were were drawn by 
these people you know when they went out to conquer different countries and created uh, and uh, you know initially the british empire and then the whole colonization and imperialism and everything happened the entire delineation of every different country including india before there were no boundaries there was no specific boundary god has not made any boundaries it is man who has made boundaries so it is this logic which has predominated the world predominated everything even us today in india are pretty much predominated by this logic so um and as i said again it's a very conflict oriented logic okay so keeping that on one side if you look at the indian logic thought process the traditional indian logic thought process okay so this is a very different kind of thought process really and it is it is the most unique thought process in the entire world to be very honest um there is no other thought process like this let's have a look at it so there is obviously the existence of binary logic if you ask any indian that is monday or tuesday immediately is going to give you an answer there is fuzzy logic also because of course you know every human being has that element in that person but it is the indian mind which has got a multi valued logic um in 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 the mind also and you know earlier when we looked at the binary logic we just saw that there are there's one um, decision point above and yes or no so those people are very fast in taking decisions because you know there are only two answers for them either this or this there's no in between yeah but when it comes to us we have got on top you know this node which is the decision node yeah and down we have the binary logic fuzzy logic and multi valued logic and what we have is we actually have a predominance of multi valued logic in our minds why is that we will we will take a look and how is it relevant okay so this is a kind of pan optic view pan optic is like you're sitting in a cockpit and you're gazing you know and then you take a choice so essentially we also find that whenever an indian is asked a question in any international interaction you can look at this there is a hesitation there is there is a thought process that occurs and then the answer is given you know so it 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 goes into this this logic loop yeah and then a certain answer comes out and typically you will find that that answer is very pacifist it is not conflict oriented it tries to avoid conflict rather than create conflict okay now there is a multi valued logic predominance it is pacific uh, pacifist there is universal agreement generally yeah and it is very relationship oriented now the, the you will find that the, the 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 binary logic is very result oriented but you know this is very relationship oriented and this is also has got a tendency to be inclusive so i always keep thinking of you know the maha upanishad um you know the the the, the famous words of uh, vasudeva kutumbakam or the world is one family basically so this kind of an ethos exists only in on the indian subcontinent yeah and um it you see this is completely in contrast with the binary where there is a differentiation you will find that uh, in the west you know there is a lot of evangelism so evangelism is basically um you know that my if, if my god is god then your god is not god that is evangelism that is binary logic yes or no so that is the reason why many of these cultures are predominantly predominantly binary or binary logic oriented but for us if you ask a hindu typically okay um or are you any person uh, the if you say is ganesha god yes is shiva god yes is durga god yes is ram god yes is allah god allah is the god of the muslims this person will not say allah is not god is jesus the son of god you know oh, for the christians but the person will not say oh no no jesus is not god we do not deny the existence so that is why because of that is a multi valued logic predominance where does that come from yeah we just looked a little while ago at the different margas the different paths the different philosophies see this has been the culture of india since time immemorial so we have always had different things sitting in one place and it's fine we have never bothered 
we have never you know created a huge amount of conflict uh, with each other because of you know um, all these issues so and whatever little conflict was there you know if you consider the, the proportion of history it is insignificant really so there is a certain ethos which exists already in india so a classic example to look at this would be as a contrast between you know europe and india so you look at you know the different languages that we have in uh, europe and then the different languages that we have in india yeah so and if you look as a comparison between the two okay, european union uh, population 508 million yeah we have double of this 24 official languages 22 official languages yeah and then we have over 100 minor languages over here here we have 150 sizable languages 1652 total languages and dialects according to one of the latest censuses so but you will find that here there are already 28 different countries they are all separated into their own houses balkanization it is called in history yeah and in india it is still one country we are far more complex and far more um, diverse and far more um, you know different to each other in terms of language in terms of script in terms of everything and yet we are still one country we are still united we still stay there is just you know here you have so many different 28 interfaces here to this entire group we still have just one single interface and that is because here in europe or western countries or wherever it is there's a predominance of binary logic it's exclusive it's you and me mm -mm, i'm drawing a line you know but here it has been a predominance of multi valued logic it's okay you can believe in that that's fine i'm okay with it i'm not going to fight with you and kill you over it yeah you're entitled to you want to you want to become a mimamsika go ahead you want to become a vedanta person go ahead you want to worship krishna that's fine you know there is a universal um, singularity basically that binds the psychology of um, indians so bearing this in mind bearing this critical and important element um and and yes i firmly believe that that this has been the very strong ethos of india really so bearing that in mind um if we look at um hinduism itself looking at the word yeah so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to break this word into two parts yeah first is hindu now where does this word really come from now if we look at our um culture if we look at our um, religious um conglomeration that has that has existed since millennia if you look at the four vedas if you look at the 18 puranas if you look at the 18 upapuranas the epics ramayana mahabharata or the various other smritis and scriptures the hitopash the upadeshas and you know we have tons and tons and tons of it not even in a single place we will we will find the word hindu no way so where does the word come from really history we have now we have to go and look at history where does it come from so if you look at this map um we have india we have pakistan and then we have obviously the sindh river or the indus river now um you will find that there is a land just beyond pakistan which is present day iran which was persian and we of course that was a unified akhand bharat at that time and so our immediate neighbors were the persians or the iranis so we had a lot of trade going on with them a lot of trade since a long time and we had trade with the greeks so the word india it comes from indica or indus comes from the greek connotation by megasthenes when he wrote the indica but where does the word hindu come from now there are different theories about this one of the theories goes that in ancient persian um the letter s was not pronounced in certain instances and so the river sindh 
was pronounced as the river Hind, the Hind River. And there was a certain connotation that came that the people who live beyond the Hind are Hindu, a geographic connotation. Yeah. Then, after that, what happens is, there is this individual. Now, we move to the 13th century, where um, in Delhi, we have the Mamluk dynasty, um, the Mughal dynasty uh, ruling. And um, basically, the most famous Ma Mamluk uh, uh, emperor was Qutbuddin Aybak, who built the Qutb Minar, and uh, many other, uh, you know, such monuments. Um, anyway, this individual, whose picture I've just put over here, um, known as Minhaj is Siraj, that was his pen name. His real name was Abu Usman Minhajuddin bin Sirajuddin, a Persian. He was a 13th century historian who migrated to India from Persia into the, into the courts of the Mamluk dynasty. And he began chronicling and he began writing certain elements of history. Yeah. This is the individual who actually referred to the region comprising, and he was very specific. Uh, Punjab, Haryana, parts of UP, etc., that northern India part, you know, where he essentially was exposed to. He called, he coined the term Hindustan. So there was a certain now an element of people of this land being called as Hindu. But there was honestly, up, even at, up, up to this point in time, it was a geographic connotation. There was no connotation of religion with Hindu. So now we leave this on one side. Now we look at what is an ism on the other hand. What is the meaning of an ism? Let's look at the dictionary definition of what an ism is. So basically here it says, an ism is a distinctive practice system of philosophy. It could be a political ideology, a religious ideology, whatever it is. But it is very distinctive it is a system and it is a philosophy. So it cannot be something which is um, the same as something else. It is very distinct. So on one hand, we have Hindu, which appears as a geographic connotation. And then we have, on the other hand, the term of ism. And an ism, as it says, is a very distinctive practice. Now, if we look at our, um, you know, if we, if we go back uh, to our uh, um, system, uh, you know, where uh, we, we had a look at, you know, the different philosophies and the different, um, um, you know, uh, margas and the different yogas and the different ways, everything is different. Yeah. So, an ism is actually the most inappropriate term to be used for for this, whatever it is, okay? So where did this term Hinduism really come from? And is it appropriate? Is it correct? Is it right? That is my intention to kind of think deep about it and provoke thought about it basically. So we have um, this individual over here, okay? I'm sure many of you might have recognized him. Raja Ram Mohan Rai from Bengal, yeah? 1772 to 1833. So it was this individual who coined the term Hinduism. Now, um, I would not like to go into why he did it. Uh, certain um, ideas are that, you know, different people have different opinions about this. Um, is that um, he wanted to create a distinction between the religions of India or uh, whatever, you know, is this, this is this conglomeration of religion in India and between the others, etc. Why he wanted to do that, um, I have no idea. Um, personally, I'm, I'm not able to find an answer to that. <laughs> now, um, however, he did it. He coined the term called Hinduism. Um, and um, so he also formed or founded, um, as we know historically, the Brahmo Samaj. So one of his ideas was uh, kind of um, 
a unification of everything like you know he studied uh, vedanta he studied um, you know hindu philosophies he studied islam he studied christianity and uh, he was a kind of uh, universalist in the in, in the sense that you know there is one god that is unifying everything and to that effect he tried to create or you know created the brahmo samaj or brahmoism where you know um, he wanted to discard every other aspect so th- there is a lot of debate basically about uh, you know uh, you know what he did and why he did it there were certain nothing in life is really black and white you know there are always areas of gray and we have to look at it with that kind of a lens uh, in order to find the real truth so um there were definitely certain social reforms that he performed um you know the abolishment of sati um and uh, child marriages so now there is as i said you know a lot of polarization um even happening in india because you know we have become very binary logic <laughs> oriented um because of uh, not only 350 years of british rule but you know the exposure to the western education system and the constant exposure to the west through media cinema etc so uh, we also seek answers in this type of debate mode yeah so um for example you know if you look at uh, whatever it is sachi or whatever it is you, you take an example of sachi so in our ethos you know if we, we need to keep going back to that picture where we have different philosophies different ideas so everything coexisting so there it was all about individual choice it has always been about individual choice actually culturally india is the most forward nation culturally unfortunately we have forgotten it we are following victorian morals and we are not understanding our own morals uh, or our, our own system you know and we are reflecting from the western system and criticizing our own people that has been happening a lot so essentially you know it, it was all about individual choice so nobody was forced to commit sati that was the basis of dharma in dharma you never force anybody the moment you start forcing it becomes adharma however there was a deterioration over time and we must understand that because we look at the yugas this is what is the beauty of you know whatever we have and i'm not you will note that i'm not calling it hinduism because i don't believe in that term just because of the discussion that we had so you know it it is about um uh, entirely about individual choice as i said Uh, and 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 the understanding of you know uh, dharma we, in the next session we will go into a, a little more detail into you know what that might mean okay i'm not making any claims to it it's, these are just thoughts and as i said this is also to um, for you to you know think about and then um, have open discussions really so as i was saying that you know we go from yuga to yuga from krita yuga or sati yuga we go to treta yuga we go to dopar yuga we go to kali yuga where the deterioration of dharma and what goes up must come down what goes down must come up so you know that is the cyclicism of nature nature is always cyclic it doesn't go in one line and that is why our thought processes are more nature oriented yeah and even the term dharma actually means righteous conduct in accordance with nature prakruti anusar it has to be in accordance with nature if you're going to go against nature it becomes adharma so we will delve a little um, deeper into that in the in probably the next session yeah so essentially uh, coming back to raja ramohan rai you know he um he was uh, instrumental in um you know stopping you know certain practices which had deteriorated and become mandatory so for example um, sachi if 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 two people are married at a young age and you know the, the husband dies due to some reason and if you're going to throw the woman into the fire no that is not a dharma <laughs> that is definitely not dharma it has to be her choice entirely and that used to be our spiritual individualism in the past we did not have a legal system as such we only had the system of dharma and uh, it was the system of dharma that predicated and predicted all our laws and you know the way we 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 are supposed to behave um, the dharma shastra is an example and um, um the, the entire western system of law you know uh, has been brought a very linear structured system and dumped upon 
our nation. And that is why I believe that it has caused tremendous confusion among the minds of Indians. Um, very honestly, it is my personal belief that we Indians are culturally the most confused people in the world today. Um, because on one hand, what has happened to us is we have this tremendous, rich, brilliant um, ethos of religion, of thought, of philosophy, of humanity. And what has happened over a period of time, particularly after the advent of the British and imperialism, is that we have been exposed more and more towards the Western ideas, and we have started adopting their behaviors and their value systems. Because, you know, psychologically speaking, there is something which is called the association of values to achievements. So when you look at their achievements, when you look at, ah, they went to the moon, oh, they must be doing something right. Oh, look at that car, that's a Mercedes, it's a high luxury Mercedes, and I'm on a bullock cart, so they must be doing something right. So I start replicating their behaviors so or start behaving like them. I start trying to emulate their values. But one of the issues that we have here is our entire psychological system is based on cyclicism of nature. And their entire system is based on an anti-nature system. And I was just looking at the time. So um, I think I'm going to squeeze in something here for the next 10 minutes or so. I don't have a slide for that because I did not think that I would need it, but um, I think it is interesting. Um, so when I keep talking about this, you know, on one hand, Indians being cyclic in nature and these people being um, anti-cyclic uh, in nature, where does that really come from? Let me explain to you um, just without a slide. Yeah? So um, a lot of things in human behaviors and human psychology depends on the climate and it depends on the weather. Let's look at how. Now, if you look at um, Germany, okay. um, and let us go back to Germany um, in the, let's go back about 1500 years back to the fifth or sixth uh, century AD. Uh, I'm looking at three countries now, Germany, Netherlands, and Denmark. Okay. So here we used to have these tribes known as Anglo-Saxons. They were Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. Collectively, they were known as the Anglo-Saxons. Now, in, these, in, 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 in this situation, uh, you know, there used to be six to seven months of winter every year, harsh, deadly winters. So basically, they used to have only five or six months. And within those five or six months, they have to hunt, they have to fight wars, yeah? They have to find food, they have to salt the food, they have to smoke the food, they have to store the food. They have to finish all their repairs. They have to do everything because once the deadly six month winter sets in, you cannot hunt, you cannot go and find food, you know? So if you do not have enough to tide you through that winter, you're dead, your family is dead. So because of this limited time duration, time and resource management became extremely critical for them. It became inherent in their blood. That is the reason why Germans especially are so critically mechanical and precise in whatever they do and measure oriented. So later what happens is these people, these particular tribes, yeah? Yeah, another psychological element, what happens to them is winter comes every year, it is part of nature. It is cyclic, it keep, but they hate the winter. Even today, even today in, in these countries, cold countries, they hate the winter. That is the reason you find them lying on the beaches in Goa, you see, because they want the sun, they crave the sun. And it happens, believe me, it, it has happened to me. Because when I faced a six-month winter for the first time, I was dying for the... I, I was trying to go out and find the sun. It happens. So they develop an anti-cyclic mentality. You know? An anti-cyclic mentality is an aversion to winter. They hate the coming winter. And because of that anti-cyclic mentality, they now become amenable towards a linear mentality. That's the first psychological phenomenon that happens. The second thing that happens is... They want to conquer nature, you know, they want to beat nature and that makes them more oriented towards technology also. Now, uh, what happens to these tribes is they migrate to the United Kingdom 
and they become known as the Anglo-Saxons. They were called there by you know, some kings, um, and there was a king called Vortigen. And again, this is disputed, but one of the suggestions that he invited them to come here and fight certain wars. And they defeated the Celts, who were the local people at that time. The Celts ran away to Ireland. Yeah? And that's why the Irish people is a, it's a Celtic uh, uh, culture over there, which is different from these people's culture. So the, these people became the Anglo-Saxons. They dominated and they took control of this country. Um, and this was in the 5th and 6th century AD. Yeah. But here, what had already happened is the Romans were here for 400 years and they had left Christianity. Yeah. And I'm in York, which is, one, which is the last stand of uh, uh, England, really, when it comes to the Roman bastion here. So this is a completely Roman history place. So what happens here in, uh, in England is that then once these Anglo-Saxons come there, see, they have already, uh, mind you, they have come with a psychology which is against nature. Then they adopt Christianity, which is the one life concept. It has concept of only one life. Yeah? So they discard all their old pagan beliefs. In the pagan beliefs, they could go into, you know, they could live in another life and do certain things like that. They had certain notions. But here it's one life. After that, you either go to hell or you go to heaven after the day of judgment. Yeah. So now they take the resource management, time management, and they fit it into one life. So whole life becomes one plan. At the age of this, I must do this. At the age of this, I must do this. Before I die, I must look at the Eiffel Tower. I must look at this. I must look at that. I must look at the bucket list. <laughs> you know. So that is why they become very self-oriented and self-centered also. Yeah. There's no time for anything else. Hey, one life, I got this plan. I got to do it no matter what. My plan stands. So this is basically the psychology that exists uh, in these nations. So now let's go to India and see what makes it different over there. Let's go back the same 1500 years ago back into India. So we have four seasons. Yeah. And, you know, whether you're going to put the seeds in agrarian agricultural society with an abundance of land and food. Yeah. Um, whether you sow the seeds now or the next week. It's okay, you can wait, you know, time is not critical from a perspective of weather and climate. It's not gonna kill you. But for these people, if they don't hunt today and if they don't hunt tomorrow, they're dead, you know, unless they stove for the winter. So we were more leisurely, we were more relaxed. The second thing is we became pro-cyclic, why? Because we wait for one event every year and we still wait for it and that is the monsoon. So if there is no monsoon, there is no food for us. You know, so the bounty and the harvest will not exist without a monsoon. So we become pro-nature. We await the events of nature, but here they're against the events of nature. You see, there's totally different psychologies at play here. So um, what happens then here is um, we also, there's another interesting phenomenon that takes place psychologically. That is, you know, here in these cold climates, there is preservation. So if you see a, if there's a dead body or, you know, it, it gets mummified in the snow or it gets mummified as a fossil, it gets mummified in the ice, you know, like that ice man's body was found about 20 years ago in Switzerland, in the Alps. So, or if you keep an apple in the, in the cold, you know, it's going to be there. So they are used to a preservation mode of mind. But for us, in the heat, things get destroyed very easily. So we become more cyclic in nature. We understand that, you know, that which uh, is born is gonna die. It becomes visually more evident and we become more amenable towards a cyclic mentality. And that is one of the reasons why we had that kind of a development in our psychology, because everything we observe, you know, the moon goes around the earth, the earth goes around the sun, the, the solar system, the universe, everything is going round and round. You see, nothing is going in a straight line, except these countries, you know. They are the only ones who are going in a straight line. And I do think it's a bit unfortunate that we are following that, but that's a different subject. So anyway, um, I just thought I'll fit this in, uh, you know, just to explain, because this will give a good context also for um, the continuance of the, of the discussion um, going into, again, you know, uh, the, the conglomeration of religions, et cetera, that we have in India. 
Now, uh, just before I conclude for, for today, um, there is one more term, uh, obviously, which, which definitely is worth mentioning. And we will go a little deeper into this in the next session as to understand what, what this term is. And that is Sanatana, Sanatana Dharma. Yeah. So Sanatana essentially means eternal. And uh, Dharma, of course, right conduct in accordance with nature. So, and of course, there are a certain other um, uh, ways of looking at it also, which we shall look later on. Um, so, even in India, even the reference to Sanatan is, is, is very far and few in between. You will find it in the Gita, a reference. You will find it in the Ramayana. Um, and you... In, in the Ramayana, it is even it is actually in the Aditya Hrdaya Stotram, you know, where Agastya, Agastya Rishi has written, uh, you know, the, the Stotra, which Ram recites in order to get the energy and the strength to kill Ravana at the battlefield. So, Rama Rama Mahabaho, Shrinu Guhem, Suna Sanatanam, he says. So, all that he's saying is, Ram Ram, great warrior, listen to this eternal secret. So, so he is actually even giving a context of the secret of Aditya Hridaya Stotram. That not, he doesn't mean it as a religion. But yes, there has been reference to Sanatan. And there could be a certain reason as to why there is that, that particular reference. And then we will go. And it's very interesting, trust me. It's very interesting. So we can go into that um, next week um, when, we, when we have this session at this, at this particular time. Yeah. So, in conclusion, um, having looked at you know what this is and uh, you know Hinduism, uh, to me uh, the term is both um, inaccurate as well as inappropriate. I don't think it makes it it has a direct relevance or reference to whatever is there in the country, and I don't think it makes sense to be very honest. Uh, that is my my view. Yeah. And of course, everybody is entitled to their view. Um, so, 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 for today's session, um, yeah, that would be uh, the conclusion of my talk. And uh, Harinath, I would like to open the floor for any discussions, questions. Thank you, Hemant. Thanks a lot for this great talk. Uh, so now the session is open for comments, uh, questions, and answers. Uh, please come forward. Yogesh ji, uh, uh, There is no question, but uh, some addition to the word uh, Hindu or something like that. To see in Assamia language, in Assamia language, there is no AC is being spoken. If your name is Ashok, then they say Ahok. They okay. were Ahom kingdoms. Actually, they were mm. Ashok kingdom. Ahom kings were uh, fighted with the Muslims and they, uh, unko karib karib 17 times they repelled back the Muslims. They never lost the battle. Mm. Uh, similarly, in Bangla and Odia, mm. ya, ya is never pronounced. Ya. Mm. If, if my name is Yogesh, no, they always call me Yogesh. It is being pronounced right. as J, J, J. Something like in uh, South Indian languages, if you write Satis, yeah. in spelling you yeah. write Satis, Satis, something like that. So it is, it is oh, maybe good. due to some pronunciation or something like that. It might have happened from Shindu to Hindu and all that. Maybe yeah. uh, in due course. That's all. Definitely. I mean, correct. And in Bangla, you know, in, in the Bangla language, you, you do not have the letter V also. So yeah. say B. So yes. it, is, it is never Vijay, it is Vijay. Yeah, Vijay, Vijay. <laughs> Vishvesh Bharaya. Ah. Amar Bangla, yeah. Ah, so, yeah. You're right, yeah. So, so they yeah. never say Vijay, they say Vijay. <laughs> okay, uh, fine. Uh, so, Murli, please go ahead. Uh. Um, hi, Hemant. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I think towards the end, you were talking about uh, Hindu and ism, and then you mm. talked about Raja Ramon, Ramon Rai. 
i didn't understand yeah. the connection of uh, raja ram mohan rai to the to, because i think you were talking of hindu sindhu that i could follow but the ism part yeah. and then you talked about raja ram mohan rai so i couldn't follow the connection there so can you he maybe is the person a little bit hmm. sure sure he is the person who coined the term hindu okay okay so the, the entire word you know see for example we had hindu before mm-hmm. but see honestly in india even i can remember like when i was a child uh, mm-hmm. when i went to school when somebody would ask me what's your religion you know i would get a little confused because my father is a vaishnava and my mother is a lingayat you see mm-hmm. but that's all that i could think about i would never say i am a hindu mm-hmm. because the person who is asking me is a brahmin <laughs> mm-hmm. you see so i mean i i never personally use the word hindu as um, as it being my religion but over here in the uk i have to use it because they don't understand anything else mm. so basically raja ram mohan rai coined this term and that is why i was kind of also questioning it mudli and saying that the ism doesn't apply not to this conglomeration that we have because there are too many distinctive practices there are too many beliefs there is too much variety yeah so sankhya mm-hmm. is different from vedanta is different from mimamsa is different from nyaya is different from vaisheshika there are dvaita dvaita so many different things we have so mm-hmm. it is not a distinctive practice at all so you cannot group it under everything and call it an ism that is impossible to do for you can call the, for example you can say brahmanism yes mm-hmm. because when it when we talk about you know brahmanism there is a certain um, boundary around it which can be called distinct but mm. but definitely not to this entire uh, conglomeration so th- sure. th- that was my gray area of question saying that you know why did he even call it hinduism i have i have no idea why he called it that but i do not believe that it was right i, I think he must have been, been trying to make it easier for the westerners to understand so he was like a uh, straddling both worlds right Possibly. Trying, so to that extent he was Possibly. like uh, intel- sh- yeah yeah i mean that is something i i mentioned where i said that you know it is likely that he might have um to, to create a distinction you know and to, to put a blanket over this and you know to create that but then the question is why do it at all you know mm. and that is a very deeply philosophical question which i think we we will definitely go into the next session to think about whether a name is even essential or necessary and what happens when you give it a name mm. sure and i have an, a second question so in the anglo saxon example sure. you talked about the fact that they uh, the um, they hated the uh, the winter and and but um, you know you could also um, argue that why would they not welcome the summer so you said they went okay, anti, like you, 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 they went anti nature but it's some part of nature is also something they're looking forward to correct so yes but it's a question of proportion mm-hmm. it's a question of proportion see for them the moment spring comes in and winter ends there is no real time for celebration it's like mm-hmm. come on we got to get the food we got to get the stuff we got to get this you know it's, it's they are already in action so mm-hmm. it, it's it's a question of proportion more than anything else so yes of course they would welcome the summer and they would love it and you know they would you know but that does not make them pro nature simply because the effect of the winter is that of death so when you look at it from that proportional perspective see again you know as as i said that nothing is black and white there are always gray areas so you will also find that in these countries there are different degrees of behaviors depending upon how harsh the winter is mm. so if you go towards finland for example you will find that their communication is almost zero with each mm. other and with, with anybody else almost zero mm. so it, it, it's a very interesting phenomenon yeah. so one significant part of the weather or the year is an enemy to them so that's the anti absolutely well, and while it, while how how are harsh a summer is in india it is not mm. i think to the extent of being an enemy of of uh, of us it right? isn't so, it isn't unless the monsoon does not come to correct so if there is a famine then we are finished sure so so that is that is why you know our the proportion of us 
awaiting and praying for an event to happen is way greater than these people uh, detesting that um, you know event which cannot be stopped from coming in which why another reason is in a lot of this english and all that the word warm and keeping warm is very important um you know that's oh, I mean, multiple multiple thing but that is like the word warm is not a um like warm hearted warm multiple things so but it's not a relevant word in the indian context definitely not and um you see even today murli um there are in, in this country in the united kingdom sometimes you find uh, you know uh, there are uh, if there are economic issues uh, for example during the recession etc so older people they die due to the cold because you know they may, they may not have electricity or pay for the electricity mm. so it it is a killer you see so even even today um they don't like it they just don't like winter over here mm. Mm. they don't look forward to it they say ah mm. that's our good thank you look forward to the next talk most, most welcome yeah okay uh, vijay kumar sir do you have yeah. a Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, does it uh, don't we require identity Hinduism and Sanatan Dharma provides uh, gives us an identity uh, to our religion and uh, to our religion and our culture, culture as well. So we need a common identity uh, for our survival uh, in the. present world you said you said it you use the term vijay present world the present world is binary logic dominated and that is perhaps why raja ram mohan roy also created the term hinduism i don't know okay. so that is a debatable thing so it is whether you look at it as a practical thing that i need to differentiate myself from everybody else see today in the world this binary logic and this differentiation has created every single problem in existence all the wars are fought because of differentiation and binary logic and um, if you look at um, you know as i mentioned vasudeva kutumbakam where does that stand then you see so do you look at it in what order do you look at it do you look at it as human nation etc 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 or do you look at nation human etc etc how do you look at it what is what is the dharma prioritization yeah. you know? no uh, i look at uh, uh, sanatana dharma so sanatana yeah, I mean, dharma uh, you know i identify myself as a follower of sanatana dharma and uh, hinduism or hindu will fall within that sanatana dharma i disagree with that because i as i mentioned because in this see, I, I, see huh because whatever you have whatever you have mentioned uh, about uh, human and uh, uh, the value of the human and other other uh, things you mentioned that we should not be mm. confined to a nation uh, 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 you know all comes uh, within the framework of sanatana dharma so if you are a follower of sanatana dharma you are universal so oh, about that i agree Oh. So again, I think, but uh, yeah. but 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 that again, mm. the, that is the you know that's a very tricky question really. It is like, do you define yourself entirely by a particular identity? Yeah, because when you do that, what you're doing is you're creating a difference. You're creating a line, and that again is going in contrast against you know the humanity element. So there has to be a balance somewhere. so yeah. it doesn't matter what you follow it doesn't matter what you follow as long as that balance is maintained that you know every but every apple in the basket is fine with me you know that is the primary principle of dharma really more than anything else because as i said within the entire conglomeration that we have itself you know we have all vaisheshika vimam vimam sa nyaya shankha everything you know all then many things are different from each other and even in the gita krishna says among the philosophies and sankhya and sankhya is in contrast with vedanta so you see there is a respect so we have to follow it's more about following that psychology 
as an identity than about uh, having something on paper. Okay, so next uh, question uh, from Nagi. Nagi, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just, I just uh, 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 want to understand. Nagi, Epo, Epo is coming. Yeah, yeah just. Yeah, it's not a question, but I just uh, had a comment and I wanted to get your opinion on that. Uh, see, when you were talking about the Anglo-Saxons moving to England and uh, uh, when they started defeating people and the, you said uh, then they started embracing Christianity and yes. uh, that is when they fell into this mold of I have a single life and therefore I need to plan all those things at the age of 10, 15, 20, I need to do all those things you said. Mm. Um, while that is true, but I don't think uh, that is Christianity specific because even in India also, uh, while, uh, see, first of all, to start believing in karma and uh, uh, second life and all that, it'll take some time. The person would have reached his 30, 40s. But even after you sort of start believing in that, everyone would plan for the current life itself because you don't know what you'll become in the next life. Okay, so the reason is, um, uh, since we don't know what will be in our next life, most of that planning is uh, happens in this life. So more than whether it's a Christianity thing or Hindu thing, I think it is human nature, and which is only getting worse. Because if you see my father's generation, it was more of uh, when I retire, I need to have a house with my PF money and all that. Now generation is, I need to make money for me, for my kids, everything. So it's getting worse and worse. So that is the thought process, I think, which is becoming more prevalent. Okay, Nagi. Um, in, in response to that, okay, let me put it this way. Okay. Human psychology, you know, is common across all human beings. There is a certain element which is common across all humans. For example, whether you're an African or an Eskimo or an Indian, you're going to love your children, you know? So this, this, is, this is called the human element, which, which lies and then greed, all these aspects, uh, insecurity, all these aspects, everything is there. Okay? See, in, in our concept of dharma in India, okay? When um, there, there, is a, there is a very interesting um, conversation uh, between Arjuna and Krishna, about um, the conquest of nature, you know. So where does man stop conquering nature? Because man is insecure. That is why, you know, in this three uh, trinity that we have, Shiva, who is, uh, you know, um, actually they, they destroy, but actually he is not the destroy. Next session we will see what exactly he is. And then, you know, we have Vishnu, the preserver, who is definitely the preserver. And then we have Brahma. Brahma comes from Brahma. Brahma is a human being, basically the psychology of the human being, because we Brahma is insecure. You see, he tries to conquer nature, and that is why he gets punished. That is why Rudra chops off his fifth head, because he's trying to exploit nature to a high degree. So whether it is India or whether it is this thing, whether it is that human element psychology is going to remain the same. The difference is that in these nations, first of all, they already have a huge orientation towards uh, time and resource management because of the winters, which winters are also going to exist in the United Kingdom when they come over here. So what happens is the moment they embrace Christianity and it becomes a very limited time for their whole life, basically. So, but for us, whether we understand karma, you know, it, it, is, it is not binary in nature. It all depends on the individual. It all depends on the culture. So we have the human element. On top of that, we have the culture, which is sitting. So here, the culture is such that it is making them even more prone towards high level of planning. You know, we do plan, but not to the extent of that, what they do over here. You know, that's the difference. So, for example... Why is time so important to these people? Every minute, you know, if the meeting is at one o'clock, they will be here one minute before one o'clock. But for us in India, 10 minutes, 15 minutes late is fine. Because when our culture comes in, and our understanding of karma and punar janma and all these things come in, we realize that time doesn't matter. It is your right conduct and your right behavior that matters more. So these are two contrasting um, psychologies 
uh, you know, that come into existence, basically. So what you're saying is not right. The human element is there everywhere. It is what adds on in the form of cultural psychology on top of that, that causes the difference in proportions. Yeah, I actually, uh, while you were talking, I was just thinking about the same thing. This uh, cultural concept uh, coming in, right? I, I got one small answer to that. Uh, even though based on human psychology, uh, here also Indians start making uh, assets and money for their kids and all that. I think uh, I do agree that there's an underlying thought, irrespective of whatever I do, what he will experience or uh, uh, what, what he experience or enjoy is based on his karma. So we go back to that, I think. So I think that that's an idea. We, we do. That is, a, that is a, you know, again, a traditional cultural um, psychology that, you know, uh, many of us have. And uh, at the same time, see, we, Lakshmi, right? Consort of Vishnu. So we are not saying that uh, earning money is wrong. So, you know, initially I talked about the Pravritti Mara, the path of Vishnu, where within society we have to live, we have, and then we have Dharma, but Dharma comes first, then comes Artha. You know, Artha is economic activity. And without that Lakshmi and economic activity, this world of Brahma cannot go round and round. We understand that very well. But what we are doing it is we are qualifying it by proportion of importance. Dharma comes first, Artha comes next, Kama comes next. And only after all these three have been fulfilled, can you strive for moksha. So it's a psychologically beautiful way of approaching it. But here, it's nothing. It's a desperate run. It's a rat race, you see. See, for example, um, an interesting phenomenon, okay. Um, the, the, the whole psychology of the West is um, making a whole pile of money by retirement. Yeah. That's it, isn't it? So all your life you earn, you make this huge pile of money when you have little time left. So this, you know, when I was in HDFC Bank last year and they called me and they sat me down because they wanted to present certain things to me. And they said, we are going to give you the best financial plans, uh, Mr. Rangan, for your future and for your investing and everything. I said, okay, sit down. First of all, I've worked in financial services for 20 years. Yeah. So you don't have to tell me about the plans. I said, I will tell you a plan which you have forgotten. What is that plan, sir? I said, it is sannyas. No. I just told them that I don't want to earn money till the age of 70, make a pile, wait for my kids to fight over it and die on top of that money. So we have a certain different approach, which is, again, we call it dharma. Dharma is again going in accordance with nature. So. Our ancients have thought about the entire process beautifully as to how a human psychology should evolve over a period of time. You know? so, so we have these underlying differences. You know? And um, these are just some questions that I'm throwing up really uh, as food for thought. Okay. Thank you. Maggie, have you done? Okay. Uh, one comment I had, Hemant, uh, was on this. Uh, interview. Yes, sir. Uh, e e perspective on Hinduism was completely new to me because I didn't know that Rajaram Mohan Rai was the first person to use it. That's uh, something very, very interesting, insightful. Because I knew Hindutva was used and uh, Veer Savarkar actually has written an article to distinguish between Hindutva and Hinduism. Uh, that was much later. Yeah. yeah, much later. Correct. And now I can understand that context also much better because there... There he clearly explains Hindutva as a geographical, as a as a national identity, not as a religious identity. In that, that's yes, there is a complete part. difference. That's a geopolitical identity. Correct, right. Now coming back to so, this one, one more interesting thought that came was: Oh, this ism mm -hmm. is added only to Hinduism. So we, there is nothing, no ism added to Christianity or Islam. Right? Yeah, I, I I had the very same thoughts because they are, they qualify much more. For an right. then uh, Hindu Hinduism is the one which doesn't qualify at all for an ism. No, very very interesting. Yeah. Uh, but the only one that I that I really found uh, was Zoroastrianism. Right, Hinduism you know, uh, and <laughs> no, Very nice, thank yeah. you. You're most welcome. Any other question or thought? Huh?
Now, just just one more thing. Uh, you are talking about the Hinduism, right? And also about the Persian uh, scholars uh, talking about the Indus River and all that. I have yeah. a, a sort of uh, a sloka with me, but I I am not able to trace the uh, when this happened. Okay, it says Himalayam Samarabhya Yavadindu Sarovaram Tam Deva Nibitam Rastram Hindu Sthanam Prachakshate. From Himalayas to Yavad Hindu Sarovaram, meaning Indian Ocean, Tam Deva Nibitam Rastram Hindu Sthanam Prachakshate. So I'm, I'm not able to, I've seen it somewhere, but I don't know what the source of that is, yeah, like how old that is. It would be definitely composed because the term Hindu, Hindustan itself was composed in the 13th century. And okay. then, um, you know, um, for, for example, um, uh, who was it? Was it Akbar or somebody? Uh, Shah Jahan, I think, who ordered the translation of uh, several of the Upanishads um, into uh, the Farsi language. Um, and um, so, see, it could have happened during those times. Um, so I, I, I do not think because see, if you look at it, the term stan, Hindu stan. Okay? So even though in Sanskrit we have stan, and Sanskrit, by the way, etymologically is the mother of all languages, including Latin. But you will find that in Central Europe there are many stans. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you know, from a linguistic perspective, Kyrgyzstan, Tadakistan, all these lot of stans are there. So that is why this individual, um, you know, um, Siraj, Sirajuddin, he, he, he just decided to call it as Hindustan. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, but pre pretty interesting to hear that. Um, no, uh, but, uh, shloka. One comment I have, Nagi, is you see, many such uh, Sanskrit shlokas were also written during our independence time. Okay. That would be my guess. Mm. Uh, but, sir, as a comment, maybe. Sir? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this uh, shloka which uh, Hagi quoted uh, was quoted also by Swami Sharadanandaji in the Sanatana Dharma Parichaya. There are some 10, 12 videos, 14, 14 videos uh, in that he has quoted this as being stated in the Smritis. As being stated in the Smritis, he has quoted it. Uh, I do not know when it was composed. I have no comment on that. Uh, that, that, is, uh, yeah. that is interesting. Yeah. And secondly, this uh, translation of Upanishads into, into Persian hmm. is, it was done by Shah Jahan's son, Dara right. Shiko. Dara Shiko, correct. You're right. Yes. Yeah. So yes, it was Darashiko. Yes. I got it translated and. Yes, Mr. Bhatt. I agree. Correct. Yes. Yeah. It would be interesting to know which of the Smritis would have that. Because, um, you know, the only terms that we had was Bharat Varsha and Jambudvipa. So even. No, no, but, uh, Jambu but, Dvipa, um, mm. but this this statement says that it is in the Smritis. And yeah, yeah, Hindustanam he, he, Prachakshati. But he must. Say which smriti is it? Because there are many smritis. So, and uh, smriti again, a mm. smriti is that which is written by men. And um, huh. there has to be. It is written by men, yes. But some it can validation. be quite ancient also, yeah. right? Smriti is written it by men, be, but it can but, be uh, quite ancient also, right? But uh, it can be. Yeah. It, it, it can be. It can be. Sir, but, but uh, even uh, sthana as used as for a nation is not there in Sanskrit, right? Sthan is, a, I thought it was a... It's just a place. From Persian. No. Persian. No. No, no is it? Sthana. It, it, sthana it, is a Sanskrit word. Yeah. Sanskrit word, yes. No, no. Sthana is a Sanskrit sthana. word. Sthana is a place is in, in Sanskrit. Correct. Yes. Maybe but in, in, in these languages, in the middle, in, in, in you know, the central... Um, European languages. That also means, uh, uh, but the connotation of place is greater there. So, because they have, for example, you have all these countries that I mentioned, like Kyrgyzstan, Turkestan, all these stans are there. Lots and lots and lots of them are there. So, that is where this was created, basically. That, you know, the, the word of, the, the appearance of Hindustan. So, 
Shradanand, Shradananda might have even said that, you know, uh, that the, it, it existed wherever it existed, but even if it did exist, it was never widely used. The historical emergence of the use of Hindustan started during that time. So, um, and, and again, there is no reference to the word Hindu really anywhere. So if it is there in some Smriti, I would be really interested in knowing which one it is. Um, for my personal interest to kind of really find out. Because the ultimate aim is to find the truth. Okay, uh, so I think uh, next question by Anil, sir. Anil Nandi, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Hemant. Uh, yes, Anil. Yeah. Uh, like uh, the lot of discussion took place on uh, the word of uh, word Hinduism. Mm. Uh, like uh, based on attaching this ism, uh, mm. is it require? Is, does it require so much of uh, investigations? Uh, uh, like the Christianity, there is no Christianism there. They use mm. Christianity, so it's a Hinduism, mm. maybe Jainism, Sikhism, mm. etc. Uh, Mm. Maybe in Muslim, Muslim Islam, they, there is no ism or it is something like that. Uh, do they require the study on how they have called this by name or is it uh, simply uh, maybe the use of English uh, as a part of convenience attachments to these various uh, sects? No, it, it, it depends Anil, on, how you, on what is the level of intellectual thirst that you have in order to find out certain things. So, for example, um, for me personally, it is, it's, it's an incorrect name. So why am I using it? And why did nobody in the history of India protest against it? So everybody used it, you see. So um, it, it's just a curiosity more than anything else. It doesn't really cause any impact as such, but it is worth thinking about. And it also gets you thinking about what it really is, you know. And, and, and the way, and what is the perspective with which we should be looking at it? Because to everybody in the West, Hinduism is Hinduism, Hindus in India, and then there's a whole set of tenets and principles that they follow, which is completely incorrect. So what so are the other ways of uh, calling it as a sect or something? Like that? Is there other, no, uh, other alternatives? And see, that is, the, that is the thing, you know, there was a particular reason why I left that placeholder with a question mark in it. Because um, the uh, the best way, perhaps, is to just refer to it as Sanatana Dharma for you know, for um, for for multiple reasons. Uh, but even when, if you look at Sanatana Dharma, it, it it is also more oriented towards Vedanta. And um, uh, there could be certain in, in our next session, we we will try to have a look and see as to why it may be called Sanatana. Um, so, so basically that's it, uh, you know, um, it, it's a question about, um, uh, basically I'm just trying to punch holes into it and see what comes out, uh, Anil, because the, otherwise, you know, you will not get a deep and comprehensive understanding and you will Maybe simply different accept. Different people have different thoughts and come out with this word. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, Okay, uh, next question from Nikhil Rao. Uh, Yogesh ji, one minute ji. Ah, ah, thank you. Then, Nikhil, please. Uh, Namaste, Iman, sir. So, I mean, I, I was just listening to the, yeah, I was listening to this conversation about this uh, uh, description of uh, Hindustan and all that. So, that sloka which was being referred to is, uh, so mm -hmm. there are claims that it is in Vishnu Puran, which is not there. There is claims that it is in Brihaspati Sutra, which is also not the truth. Actually, this is coming from something known as Brihaspatya Sastra or Sutra, whatever they want to call it, is supposed mm -hmm. to be the book of the Nastikas. Nastikas? Oh, definitely. Uh, uh, Nastikas means people who are okay. atheist. See, just like every other, see, Hinduism, like you said, is so flexible. There is also mm -hmm. a flexibility of choosing atheism if someone wants to. Absolutely. No Absolutely. No one is Absolutely. going to stop them. So Absolutely. what happened is there were uh, there was a Nastika following at some point of time, and they had mm -hmm. this sort of book and all that, and they were following it. Uh, reports say that as of now there is no such record, and it's difficult to get that book. The written form is gone, 
only some sotas like this are lying around so that is the information that uh, has come out and uh, i think the other comment i have is regarding how uh, we are thinking what should we identify ourselves as as i think that question mark you have put is very appropriate i would say that there is no need to identify ourselves with others simply because absolutely simply because simply because we are following path of dharma and the truth and righteousness there is no need to say that okay i am what what am i i am i know what i am i am uh, i am an atman and i am a jivatma and i am following the path of dharma doing my karma and going about my life so whether i am you call me whatever you want to call me you call me or that is your uh, you know normal nature but i do not want to be called anything as such is probably what i would take yes sanatana dharma is a dharma or a path which we are following but uh, i mean it it's very hard to fit ourselves into the uh, you know semitic religions and abrahamic religions it doesn't fit there we are exactly that exactly that's why you know ism is the most inappropriate in every sense yes i, I totally agree with that uh, question mark <laughs> okay. so that was my comment uh, thank you so much yogesh ji no uh i think there is some difference between stands uh, because you see if we were to use afghanistan mm. it states that the people afghan people or afghan origin people are staying over there if we say kyrgyzstan turkestan or whatever stan mm. it may be that mm. means that place or the people those who are originated from there and they are staying there but in mm. case of india it is hindu is connected mm. with the religion they believe no. that all indians they they believe that the all indians are hindus so they We know that ones. while in case of Tur- turkestan they don't say islamistan we are connecting it with the religion and it was raja ramon roy who associated with the religion before that there, it didn't exist as that concept at all see in But india then, everybody would refer <laughs> we would refer to ourselves as i am a brahman i am a kshatriya i am a gaur saraswat brahman i am a this i am a that mm-hmm. people would never come back 100 years back and say i am a hindu you know so or 200 years back you know they wouldn't say that so here when there is a geographic context and uh-huh. if if we have a record of some historian connecting the two and then calling it as hindustan you know uh-huh. so that's so if that individual one see, one of the problems that we have in india is that we all, we have taken almost everything and every notion and concept from outside and we have accepted it uh-huh. so anything that comes from outside we don't question it and we accept it yes so that is and, uh, not only that we should have been yeah. called bharatiya san <laughs> as per the location see for example Bharata our constitution san. says yeah uh-huh. constitution Constitution. See, when the Iranians or the Persians called anybody who lived beyond the Hind River as a Hindu, it is their reference. Ah, uh-huh. that is what we have said. The the people who were living at that time on this side of the Sindh River didn't call ourselves Hindu. No, they called us uh-huh. as that. Yes. But later on, when their historian comes here and then calls us as Hindustan, over a period of time, see, it's taken a long time. It, these mm. are not events that have happened overnight. Yes, so yes. It it's taken time. Yeah. Mm, oh, yes, so then, uh, finally, eventually, we have accepted. See, and then the the British, they no, even uh, called it Indo- Indostan. Right they now we it, have we have added uh, accepted to such an extent that in whichever any school form or anywhere we have to fill up the form when there is a column of religion is there, there we write Hindu. Yeah. So this is the final evolution that has happened. Yeah. So you know this is <laughs> this right, is right always from, right Hindu. I mean those who are no- Hindu from nothing it has come uh, to here. Yeah. So I remember I remember when I was in college uh, and I was trying to apply for an engineering seat and Anil and all everybody you know but sir would know about that. We used mm. to have this entire booklet where you had to take what you are. Mm. It was hey, a huge yeah, booklet uh, isn't it? Uh, not oh only my that, god that was uh, there are so many so many cars sub cars this that exactly. we have to add into it that form so many categories and so many sub categories and it was like it was harder to do that than to do the subject so <laughs> okay so, thank you yeah. man a lot of thank you most welcome most welcome
okay so with that uh, you know, we come to the end of today's session thanks everyone for the active participation thank you uh, thank you so much Sangat, for this excellent uh, insightful talk we'll thank you end much. it with a shanti mantra yeah om sarve bhavantu sukhinah sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani paschintu मा कशि दुख भाग भवे ओम शांति शांति शांति